Dr. Honeygut gave me the opportunity to provide summative comments at last year's health sciences, uh, soil health uh, meeting on the connection between human health and soil health. And I confessed at that point that um, I have had a, a soil science course, but it was in 1970-something, um, and that I thought all I needed to know was that it was in P and K and that I was pretty much a soil expert. But I have learned so much last year and this year, and, um, and Wayne has given me the opportunity to uh, provide some summative comments and some insights and some findings from last year's meeting. So this was the conference on connections between soil health and human health, and this was a great meeting had about 180 participants from 140 different institutions representing a broad range of scientists and providers, including health providers and veterinary medicine providers. Um, it was organized in a way that we had plenary speakers introduce some key topics, uh, and then we had some platform presentations or focus groups around seven particular areas. And you can find the proceedings at the website here. You can also find all the recorded uh, presentations at that website as well. So um, over the course of the two-day meeting, we also had a breakout session in which we had 10 groups work on developing key research projects that we think should be moved forward. And I'll get to those. And in the unlikely or likely event, I don't get to all 10 of those at the end. They are at the website. So uh, the Grim Reaper is looking at me. Um, and so the goals of the conference uh, were to make relevant connections between um, soil and human health sciences, to identify promising research opportunities, to build interdisciplinary teams to explore those opportunities, and then to propose funding mechanisms that would allow us to address those opportunities. So the agenda of the meeting was to, of course, set up soil health, human health connections, and this was done through two key plenaries. One was talking about the uh, human health perspective, and one was the soil health perspective. And then there were seven breakout sessions, one on influence of soil health on human nutrition, uh, soil health and food safety, chemistry bioavailability, bio, excuse me, bioavailability, fate and transport of toxins in field soils, the interconnection between soil, food, human health, and the microbiome, which obviously we've heard a lot about today is, is a key area for research the implications of soil health for human populations and communities, and then food ag policies and human health policies, looking at intersections and, and more significantly disconnections between those two. And finally, the looking at funding opportunities and funding challenges. I think we identified that a lot of uh, the challenges tend to be that human funding agencies want to look at a particular human health outcome that's difficult to directly tie to soil health. So I think that's part of what we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, first insights, we use the definition of soil health, which you will be familiar with, which is the continued capacity of soil to function as a viable living ecosystem to support human health, animals, and plants. Human health is very similar and holistic, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This is from WHO from 1948, and there was also an update of that recognizing the importance of ecosystem health and overall human health, and that we really globally must have global ecosystem health in order to have global human health. This led to a series of discussions about the importance of global climate change and the environment on human health. And what you can see here is a, um, a pictograph from WHO showing that 23% of the deaths worldwide are attributable to um, environmental impacts. And of course, one of the greatest impacts is global climate change and the changes that come with that. And it was recognized that soil health, as we also heard today and in the posters uh, last night, good soil health is imperative for uh, preventing global climate change. So we can either be in a virtuous cycle or we can be in a vicious cycle heading in the wrong direction. Not only does the WHO acknowledge that global climate change is the number one challenge to public health worldwide, but in the United States, the medical community is actually getting in front of this a little faster than elements of the government are. And this Medical Society Consortium of Climate and Health recognizes that climate change is the number one public health challenge. And this is a consortium of 18 medical societies that represent more than 50% of physicians in the United States 
including some very conservative groups like AMA, and I'm a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and we're a, a signee as well. So clearly this is an important topic uh, in terms of the medical view of climate change, but I don't think the medical community has put that together as closely with soil health as it needs to be done. We're also discussing last night, and the group I met last night at our table over drinks was that physicians tend to think of all the things that soil does bad to you, and why is that? And I do think that there is a dual nature of soils, or a dual view of soils, or a dichotomy in how we view soils. And so I like to think of this as what nat of what soils do for us, and which we've heard a lot about, and this would be uh, the basis of food production, which is obvious, ecosystem services, which I won't belabor. I learned a lot about that last meeting and continue to this meeting. And then soils also do things to us, and so this tends to be how the, the health professions view soils, and those would be causing diseases through exposure to toxins, to infectious agents, and, for example, inadequate medical content, mineral content, and the health conditions associated with that. So if we were to look at some harmful agents in soil, one would be arsenic, and on the upper left you can see some cutaneous findings associated with arsenic poisoning. And this is something that is particularly interesting to me because arsenic in soil and water into rice is such a problem worldwide that now the American Academy of Pediatrics and USDA recommends against the use of rice cereal in infants as their only source of, of food in the first 12 months of life. So I used to t tell people to start feeding their children with rice cereal, but we no longer do that because of the arsenic content in rice worldwide, including in the United States. Lead seems to be an old problem, but it has not gone away. About 2.5% of preschool children in the United States have a lead level above 50 parts per billion. That represents almost half a million children. Of course, there are a lot of consequences to lead level in children uh, in terms of cognitive, neurocognitive defects and, and not attaining um, uh, full IQ. What you can see is a red blood cell with basophilic stippling, which is a hallmark of lead poisoning. And this is not just from highly publicized water sources, as we've seen with Flint, Michigan, of course, but it remains a problem in soils. And what you can see is the relationship between soil lead concentration and blood level in children in Detroit. So uh, legacy sites, old homes, uh, yard dirt, et cetera, tends to be a, a, continues to be a major source of lead toxicity and poisoning in children in the United States, and a bigger problem worldwide. Other harmful agents include cadmium, heavy level, uh, heavy metals, and in Durham, North Carolina, near to us, there is a very interesting cluster of cadmium in soils that have gotten into women during pregnancy and has programmed their fetuses to be increased susceptibility to cardiovascular disease across the lifespan through epigenetic changes. Xenobiotics and organic chemicals, and one that we are particularly concerned with of the class, the PFAS, or the perfloral or polyfloral alkyl uh, compounds. Um, Keymore's facility on Cape Fear River has been producing these for 40 to 50 years and dumping them into the Cape Fear River. That problem's been taken care of, but we now realize that thousands of tons have been put into the air and come down in the soil in our region and is uh, now in groundwater. And then I just read a study that shows that in biosludges, this is now a source of PFAS, which are incredibly uh, uh, long-lived compounds bio-sludge bio onto soils, into crops, into cows, into milk, into humans. So this is an emerging contaminant that I think this, this um, group needs to help address. Um, then dust and infectious agents, and we've heard about E. coli, coccidiomycosis, and variety of viruses, et cetera. So that's kind of the medical view of what soils do for us or to us. But also included that is what happens if our soils have inadequate minerals. And so you can see on the upper left, you can see a child with severe neurocognitive defect that uh, is associated with hypothyroidism. And then you see a woman who has a multinodular goiter from living in an area that has low iodine. So this is uh, low, low soil iodine is a problem that affects almost 740 million people worldwide uh, and associated with hypothyroidism. Of course, the goiter can also cause um, suffocation and people die from these. And this is a re-emerging problem in the Western world in Europe where we think we would have taken care of this problem. It's now been shown that during pregnancy, 
women with higher levels of TSH, which indicates low iodine status and low thyroid function, their infants are significantly five times more likely to, to um, have a low IQ be below 85th percentile so that and lose seven points IQ points if those women are inadequate in their iodine uh, consumption. You can also see the lower left there is cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy associated with selenium deficiency with Cashon disease and Cashon Beck's disease is uh, low, low selenium is associated with um, uh, musculoskeletal issues and low selenium affects almost uh, half a billion to a billion people a year and this can be addressed on a population basis through proper uh, inclusion of selenium and fertilizer so so healthy soils helps manage this process and then low iron is uh, one to two million people are at risk uh, worldwide billion excuse me for anemia and then one of the most interesting talks and things that I learned and have followed up on since that meeting was the relationship of soil type and stroke risk this is a study from Dr. Ducey at the Agricultural Research Station in, in the Coastal Plains uh, in South Carolina along in conjunction with a neurologist at Medical University of South Carolina. And so throughout the southeast north of Carol southeastern coast of the United States and up the Mississippi Valley is a stroke belt, and in that belt there's a buckle, and the buckle runs through eastern North Carolina, eastern South Carolina, et cetera, right in the area where we practice. So the darker purple show the relative risk of dying of stroke in South Carolina. And then superimposed on top of that, you can see that the two greens uh, uh, land use types, the southern coastal plain and Atlantic coastal flatwoods looks like that superimposable with stroke risk. Dr. Ducey looked at soil types or soil properties and what you can see is that high stroke risk would be associated with uh, uh, lower or higher water table, a shorter depth to water table, poor drainage, hydric, uh, high percent of hydric soils, as well as low surface pH. So these things, of course, uh, co-segregate. But if you put this together, what you can see is that there's a very strong relationship between the risk of developing or having a fatal stroke in South Carolina if you live in an area that has shallow water table or it's poorly drained. Um, and you have protective effect if it's a well-drained soil. And then by dichotomizing the, the counties with the highest and lowest risk, you can see there's a very strong relationship between hydric soils and uh, very strongly acidic soils. Don't know the real, what causes this relationship, what's the cause and effect relationship, but interestingly, you see the same relationship for stroke risk in Great Britain. And so the further north you go in Great Britain, the higher the risk of stroke, as you see on the right there, and the further north you go in Great Britain, the more acidic and wet the soils are. And then this group has also looked at uh, the microbial biodiversity, and the more biodiverse, as shown by the darker groups, the higher the risk of stroke in Great Britain. Particularly interesting is the fact that stroke risk seems to be associated with nativity, where you were born rather than where you live. So if you live in, born in South Carolina, live in South Carolina, you have the highest risk of dying of stroke. If you're born elsewhere in Southeast North, uh, uh, United States and move into South Carolina, your risk is a little bit lower. But if you were born outside of South Carolina or the stroke belt and you move into the stroke belt and live your entire life there, you have a relatively low risk of dying of a stroke. So there's something about this that looks to be early life programming for stroke risk that is correlated with soils. So I think this is one of the most intriguing proper, uh, pro uh, areas of soil health that, that I would like to be engaged in moving forward. Um, we're also looking at infant mortality rates in eastern North Carolina and eastern South Carolina in these same areas. We have incredibly high infant mortality rates, which may be related as well. So finally, the 10 working groups came up with 10 uh, recommendations. Number one, understand the relationship between soil microbiome and human microbiome and health. Uh, integrate existing soil data maps and health data. So big data looking for gaps and unknowns and immediate actions, and I think that's where this stroke risk falls into. Understand soil health and regenerative systems around the world and how they impact global food systems and health. Uh, we need to include a variety of perspectives in how we move forward, both the healthcare, farmers, producers, et cetera. We need to engage broad section of community in tracking bioavailability of nutrients and toxins. I think this is an 
incredibly important emerging area and probably an area where it's easiest to have overlap between medical and soil health fields. Um, look at how soil health management practices influence the economics of human health. Develop permanent research sites in different parts of the country to look at these relationships. Uh, create a center to look at diverse, uh, brings diverse researchers to look at these uh, um, benefits and, and processes. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll just put the last two up there. Um, and then um, say that I think this is um, an area where we need a lot of time to develop research teams. And, um, and one thing I'll say is that we invited Dr. Honeycutt to come to Brody School of Medicine and give a presentation at one of our continuing medical education events with public health practitioners, physicians, and um, I happen to know the the, uh, the director of Eastern the the the, uh, the area health education commission that put it on, and she continues to bug me to find another Wayne Honeycutt who come and give such an incredible talk. It was eye opening for our healthcare providers to hear this talk that Dr. Honeycutt gave about the relationship between soil health and human health. And so I think the the medical field will be primed to learn about this and to get engaged in this, but it's going to take a fair amount of education and outreach. So thank you, and I'll take any questions.